So good morning. One second, okay. Sure. <laughs> Are you all from Chicago, most of you? Yes. Okay, yeah. Have uh, you been regular, regularly coming here, most of you are? Yes? <laughs> okay, so good morning again. And uh, um, before we uh, start with, the, uh, <clears throat> with our topic, I would like to invite you all uh, to join me in uh, uh, taking refuge and cultivating the four immeasurables. Until I reach full awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By means of beneficial actions such as generosity, may I attain enlightenment in order to benefit beings. Until I have reached full awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By means of beneficial actions such as generosity, may I attain enlightenment in order to benefit beings. Until I have reached full awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By means of beneficial actions such as generosity, may I attain enlightenment in order to benefit beings. May all beings find happiness from the cause of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. May they not be separated from the perfect happiness that is free from suffering. May they abide in great equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those near and far. May all beings find happiness in the cause of happiness. May they be free from suffering in the cause of suffering. May they not be separated from the perfect happiness that is free from suffering. May they abide in great equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those near and far. May all beings find happiness in the cause of happiness. May they be free from suffering in the cause of suffering. May they not be separated from the perfect happiness that is free from suffering. May they abide in great equanimity, free from attachment and aversion to those near and <clears> far. <throat> uh, thank you. So, um, where are I at? Uh, so uh, there are five, five classes, five <laughs> interesting uh, teachings that have been programmed and we're at the fourth one. Uh, this afternoon will be the fifth and last one. Uh, we discussed uh, uh, the past two days. First, uh, what does it mean to be a Buddhist? What is how Buddhism is relevant uh, in our times? Uh, in our contemporary uh, world. And then we uh, discussed uh, some of the um, basic ideas about uh, from Buddhism. Uh, also uh, kind of um, clarified through uh, the teachings of our lineage uh, about you know, the ma mind, confusion, uh, how is it that we come to experience our conditioned existence and therefore also what we, how we can free ourselves from conditioned existence. And <clears throat> uh, we briefly talked about uh, the uh, Buddhist path and uh, we also introduced uh, the reason why we should meditate and how to meditate. So those are topics we've already covered uh, yesterday and the uh, night before. And this morning, uh, we're going to look at uh, the mind uh, a little bit more in detail, in the sense that um, it will kind of uh, <clears throat> be a complement or a, 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 an additional explanation to uh, topics that we have already kind of covered uh, when we spoke about the the workings of the mind uh, previously. Mm. 
Mm. So, uh, I think this one teaching of Gampopa is very uh, interesting. Uh, we spoke about it uh, yesterday. It's a very short teaching by uh, the Master Gampopa. I'll kind of repeat it here because I think it's uh, very uh, important. <coughs> uh, there was uh, this old lady who was um, offering food to Gampopa for a time while he was in retreat. And she had requested Gampopa to give her kind of an introduction to the nature of mind and to help her uh, understand the mind and practice how to also so cultivate wisdom. Um, and Gampopa uh, gave her this uh, presentation. He said, well, uh, you should look inwardly, you know, not be, think about the external, just sit down at home and put aside your usual preoccupations and look inwardly into your mind. And uh, what will you notice about your mind? That there's all kinds of thoughts, right? What is the mind? Look inwardly, it has all kinds of concepts, thoughts, uh, feelings, uh, you, you, through your senses, you can see, hear, smell, feel, uh, uh, then you have a appreciation of this or not, it, it feels nice or not, uh, you have all kinds of concepts. This is bad, this is good, this is nice, this is big, this is small, this is me, this is uh, him, and so forth. We have a great number of thoughts that arise. But the thing, the thing that is doing all of that, that's having all these thoughts, that uh, perceives experiences uh, through the senses, uh, that has these feelings, all of that is what we call the mind. And particularly, to follow what Kambopa said, he said that's what is called uh, the luminosity. So this is a kind of a particular term uh, <clears throat> that is used in the Buddhist literature, uh, referring to uh, the quality of the mind um, the quality of the mind, which is that it reveals to itself all kinds of things, like uh, all the forms and sounds and colors and everything that you can see kind of is made, uh, uh, how to say, uh, present to the mind. Okay? And that's uh, something that the mind does, the quality of the mind. That's, and that is called luminosity. And the reason why it's called that is by, I believe, analogy with light uh, as light reveals you know uh, shapes and colors and forms and everything the same way a mind reveals this experience of life of uh, the world everything is made effective and possible because of uh, this quality of the mind okay so mind you have to characterize its luminosity. It makes all of this, uh, kind of renders all of this present, uh, reveals the world, it, it reveals itself also. It reveals uh, uh, <clears throat> our body, the mind, the world around us in itself. Uh, so that's, you could say the, what Kambuba said, he said, that's what you call luminosity. Yet if you look at this mind that has this quality that reveals all of this, and you think, well, what is it actually? Does it exist? For it to exist, you might, you might have to be able to get hold of it, see it, find it somewhere, being in some place. So you can search all you want, you'll never find that. You cannot find it somewhere. Mind has no shape. It has no color, it has no size, it has no uh, dimension. Uh, 
uh, it's almost as if it's not there. Yet it is revealing all of this. It's not, not there either. Although you can't uh, get hold of it, grasp it, it's not nothing either. So you can't really say it is existing because you can't find it. You can't say it is non-existing. You can't say it would be contradictory to say it is existing and non-existing at the same time or to say it is something else for it to be also something else, neither existing nor non-existing. I mean, also that you'd have to be able to grasp it somehow. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, so it is somehow, you know, un, kind of unconceivable. You can't really uh, conceive it. You can't e even really uh, name it. You can't really get hold of it, this mind. Although uh, it is this, uh, it has this quality that we spoke of, of luminosity. So this quality of luminosity, if you look at it, you can't really uh, you know, find its uh, being, nor its non-being. So then, uh, this is what uh, Gambopa said is called the emptiness of the mind. So that means the mind here, if we look at it, it's a luminosity, yet it is also emptiness. And <clears throat> the point here is that uh, these two are inseparable. The luminosity is not like one thing and the emptiness another thing. See, they, are, they are both uh, inseparable. So, uh, this is what is also called uh, the union or the inseparability of luminosity and emptiness. <clears throat> so that's what actually if you want to really pinpoint what the nature of mind is, uh, that's what that's what Kampopa said it was when he taught this old lady this way. So it's a very kind of simple yet very to the point uh, way of seeing. So uh, in other words, you know in Buddhism uh, what is uh, termed as awakening or the state of Buddha is not uh, like being reborn in a paradise or becoming something different. It's just simply uh, this very quality of mind that we talked about being uh, fully actualized, recognized. Uh, the, the matter of fact in our everyday functioning is that and this is not recognized. Uh, we, uh, the luminous aspect of the mind is uh, generally uh, held or grasped to as being other. That, mean, that means here, the, the mind reveals to itself uh, the world itself, but we don't see that this is part of mind. We think of it as something separate from the mind. We don't see it as our perception of reality. We think it is an actual kind of rendering of reality. We take the mind, so to speak, to be kind of like a receptor that accurately perceives reality. And what we perceive, we don't see it as, a, as something that our mind is representing to us, but we think it as being out there exactly as we think of it as being. And that's where our, so to speak, illusion lies. Uh, and we uh, attribute to this, uh, what the mind reveals to itself as something separate from the mind, something distinct from the mind, something that has its own independent entity, where in reality, it is just a perception of the mind. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, at the same time, not seeing the emptiness of the mind, we think the mind is a subject distinct uh, that perceives this reality. And there is therefore this impression of duality, that there is something out there separate 
from the mind and uh, we attribute to both that reality and the mind a substance, a independence from one another and both as having the quality of existing independently. This is, we don't maybe think about that in those terms, but in, uh, it's not explicit probably in our mind, but if we really look carefully at our natural functioning, uh, it, it is implicit in our way of dealing with uh, what we experience. We don't doubt a second that there is an I separate, that we are a subject, subject experiencing all of that, and that what the subject experiences, the experienced, uh, the mind reveals to itself, is something very separate from the mind and distinct from the mind. So, <clears throat> uh, yet, uh, the quality of the mind being empty and luminous is still ever present there. It has never left us. Yet we are not aware of that. And we are, uh, we are in a confusion about the reality of our mind. We conceive uh, this duality and we function in this duality. So of course there is much to be said about uh, this uh, topic. Uh, so one shouldn't fall, for example, into the idea of solipsism. It's not about saying that everything is your mind everything you know about reality uh, is an impression of your mind. There's a nuance there. It's not saying like the mountain, the ocean, the sea, the world, uh, other people are all your mind. But what you know of them, what your mind has revealed of them to you is not what they are. It is what, uh, it is a, a percept of your mind. It is a perception of your mind. So everything you see, everything you perceive is a perception of your mind without entailing necessarily that uh, substantially that they are you. Subst substantially, if you think about uh, the mind itself or external beings or external entities, they all fall into the, uh, into the fact of lacking a substantial uh, independent existence. They are all empty of nature. Like whether if there is even a world independent, it is inaccessible somehow. We only see what our mind reveals to us of them. And what we perceive is actually our perception of it always. We never see the mountain in itself. Whether there is a mountain in itself, of course there are, co before I was born, there was this country in these mountains. There are other sentient beings it's over there. They each have their own causes and conditions. Although they have those causes and conditions, it doesn't mean that they uh, have uh, an independent, substantial existence. They are all dependent on causes and conditions, as we spoke about when we spoke about interdependent origination. They all fall into the nature of interdependent origination. So they lack uh, inherent uh, true substance. And somehow, uh, uh, so there, there, there is, you know, a subtle nuance there. So not, it's important not to fall into kind of a solipsism view uh, here. Uh, so <clears throat> they, uh, to, to break it down very simply, you know, the main aim of uh, a Buddhist practice uh, is just simply about uh, not falling into this confusion anymore and being able to let the mind be in its innate and natural qualities. Uh, when this, all this confusion ceases, it doesn't mean that mind becomes nothing. It's luminosity and emptiness that are present here are still present uh, afterwards. There's no difference in there, but there is no more confusion. There's no more this confusion of grasping uh, these two as two distinct and substantial elements. So uh, because of this fundamental confusion, then uh, this creates, so to speak, uh, 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 conditioning forces, you know, 
that uh, it is, and so to speak, the, and this confusion then uh, entails a certain way of thinking, certain way, certain action, if you want, volition. And this uh, is a conditioning force that determines how we perceive the reality, how we perceive reality. This is what we call the uh, samskaras, and the samskaras, which are conditioning forces, are uh, um, the, the fabricating force where we fabricate, so to speak, uh, what we perceive through our action behavior. And this determines something that is conditioned, a conditioned experience. And so uh, the, the conditioned experience that we have uh, uh, enables, give, uh, gives the conditions for further action, reaction towards what we uh, are experiencing. And that reaction then uh, is a fabricating force that determines a future conditioned experience. That future conditioned experience gives uh, the frame for a reaction towards it, which is going to be another fabricating force, so to speak. This is how uh, samsara or conditioned existence really is uh, created. So it's this game between, you could say, samskaras and samskritas the conditioning forces and the conditioned phenomena. Uh, and this is how, uh, so to speak, samsara uh, is perpetuated. Um, so, uh, or first of all, of course, in that, uh, because if there's the sense of I, of course there is, uh, you could say somehow there is hope and fear. There is uh, there is hope and fear for the I, because there is the sense of I as something different, and that all that all that it perceives is being something distinct from it. So it's basically uh, you could give an an uh, analogy of a dream. You know? If you look at a dream. Uh, in a dream, you see all kinds of things that you think are distinct uh, from the dreamer. Yet the dream and the dreamer are not uh, two distinct uh, things. Uh, all that you perceive in the dream didn't really exist as such anywhere, it just existed in your perception of it as such. And this is something your mind has, so to speak, constructed. So our perception of reality, our coming into this existence is something that our, our mind has uh, constructed through because of the fact of its confusion. So <clears throat> uh, because there is this you know, idea of self, uh, then you have this I, you know, naturally hope and fear for the self. And you will have uh, you relate to what you perceive as being something distinct from the self, same thing, other. Towards that, you will uh, discriminate and you will see things as being attractive or unattractive. Towards what is attractive, you, uh, you have appreciation and uh, desire. Uh, toward what, towards what is unattractive, uh, you will develop aversion. So these are the fundamental afflictive states of mind, anger, desire. And this somehow is what motivates us, is what uh, determines our volition. And this volition then uh, uh, is not without consequence. It, it can express itself uh, physically, verbally, of course. And all of this as a consequence, it leaves, so to speak, uh, a trace or it le leaves an imprint on our mind stream. And the imprint that's left on our mind stream is like, a, it's like, a, you could say, a perfume, if you want, or uh, it was also called a seed in the sense that this impression will lead to the future experience. <coughs> and so this, uh, when we have a volition, when we get angry and we uh, acted out in one way or another, 
this leaves uh, an imprint on our mind stream that is carried through each and every instant of our mind until it comes to maturity into an experience. It itself is something impermanent, but it is uh, carried from the, in the mind stream by each instant of consciousness until it becomes, uh, it matures into a certain uh, experience, whether it is a life form like being a human, reborn as a human or an animal, and within that human condition of uh, happiness or suffering and illnesses or whatever you come to experience, those things are determined by uh, that those actions. And that is that life, so to speak, the body we have, the condition we have is kind of a result. And within this life, we are free to think, act in certain ways, or whichever way we want, so to speak. But we might have inclinations, of course, to behave in one way more than another. That is also kind of a, through our previous ha uh, habitual patterns that will um, tend to behave more in one way or another. And our reaction, that reaction, that way of reacting to something and our new behavior leaves again an imprint that determines our next life. So this we kind of saw in the 12 parts of interdependent origination uh, in more kind of the, uh, detail yesterday. So I'm here just uh, summarizing with this uh, point. So uh, as long as this uh, mechanism is present, then of course, uh, so as long as what is at the root of this mechanism is our confusion. As long as our confusion is present, then conditioned existence will perpetuate itself. Uh, and there's no end to it, so to speak. It's kind of perpetual. Now, the, the Buddhist method, the Buddhist teachings, uh, teach us how we can, on one hand, uh, through uh, working on our volition, recognizing this uh, law of causality between our thoughts and actions and our becoming, we can see that uh, there are certain types of actions that will lead to greater degree of suffering. But there are other types of actions that will lead to relative happiness and well-being. And uh, the, the, the found, let's say the basis of Buddhist ethics is that, is distinguishing between what are the actions that lead to suffering and the actions that lead to the greater happiness and uh, making resolve not to engage into the negative actions, but uh, to uh, cultivate the wholesome actions. Uh, by doing so, by cultivating good karma, so to speak, then you're able to determine more happiness, longer life, more prosperity, uh, all the favorable conditions within uh, samsara. So in essence, with this ethics, which is non-violence, uh, not harming others or ourselves, is which really uh, leads to being able to create, uh, through this ethics, more harmonious situation in our everyday life with our family and also determining for ourselves a better rebirth, a better future uh, at, at every level. However, that alone will not lead to awakening. It creates all the favorable conditions. I mean, it, it protects us from uh, um, a more painful, stressful uh, life where you have less freedom, less opportunity to practice. So really the basis to make any improvement is to follow uh, the Buddhist ethics. And on that basis, then you can uh, go further into, for example, the practice of meditation. So if you don't have that foundation, it's difficult to practice meditation. For example, you will uh, be so preoccupied by your confusion, by your stress, by all the different problems in your life, that you will not find the opportunity or the right circumstance to be able to practice meditation. So um, ethics serves sort of a ground that you can rely on, uh, through which you can really thoroughly cultivate the practice of meditation. So here, as I was saying, the basic goal of, of Buddhist practice is to overcome our confusion and actualize the inequalities of our mind. And that you can't just do by deciding, oh, I'm going to make that happen one day, uh, just 
uh, or somebody is going to do it for you. You have to do it yourself. And it entails a progressive uh, training and uh, transformation. So first, uh, you need to have that ground, uh, be able to create the favorable circumstances. And then you need to be able to work with your mind. Your mind, in its present, you could say, uh, ordinary way of functioning. It, the, the confusion is, so to speak, uh, maintained and nourished also by the fact that our mind is constantly <coughs> distracted, agitated. So you, if you look at our mind ordinarily, if you don't meditate, for example, just look at your mind ordinarily, well, it's always, there's always a degree of stress. There's always uh, this fear and hope that I was talking about related to the ego, the self. There's always uh, self-interest and concern that's, uh, so to speak, ever-present. And um, with this, then, according to the circumstances, when we, uh, are con when, we are, when we come to see things that are, we appreciate, that we think are attractive, we feel a strong uh, desire, un, un kind of tameable desire, when we're confronted with the violence of people that hurt us, we feel anger, hatred, and we, are engaged, we naturally engage into violence. This is just uh, in all of those states, for example, whether it is anger, whether it is desire, jealousy, pride, all these different afflictive states of mind, they are all characterized, uh, you could say, uh, by a state of being unwell. You could call that stress, if you like different degrees. Uh, for example, with anger, it, uh, all the different afflictive emotions stem from the main three poisons, of ignorance, uh, desire, and hatred. Okay. If you look at, uh, for example, hatred, it is clearly the, the most uncomfortable state to be in. Uh, the, the, the person who experiences hatred uh, is in a state of being where he is uh, in a state of total discomfort. It is really an uh, unsatisfying state. It's really dukkha, so to speak, uh, fully, to use the Sanskrit term. Uh, and everything related to the experience of anger is painful. That means uh, how you express yourself hurts others and it hurts yourself. It, le it determines future painful experiences for yourself. It is, uh, it's a really uh, a painful experience. You might think, well, okay, that's, I grieve for anger, but that's not really the case with desire. How is desire? dissatisfying and uncomfortable, a state of stress also. Uh, well, if you look at desire, uh, it's also unsatisfied state because by very division, definition, if you are satisfied, you don't desire, you know. Uh, you are, uh, you see something attractive and you're not happy with the way you are, you think you need to have that. And if you have that, you would be better. And that's the kind of impression of desire. So there is a, a degree of stress and unwellness there. You're uncomfortable un unless you have that. That's uh, the suffering, or you could say the uh, dissatisfying nature, uncomfortable nature, this nature of stress of, uh, of desire. But, and now where it comes to ignorance is more subtle. It's like the frame for the possibility of desire and anger to arise. It's that confusion. It's not per se uh, a stress, but it is the, the framework which enables stress to come about, to arise. So, uh, unless these three poisons are, so to speak, vanquished, then samsara perpetuates itself. We can kind of tame these three poisons through our 
uh, conduct and uh, following ethics and so forth, but we cannot really uh, uproot them completely unless uh, <clears throat> we, on the basis of meditation, uh, cultivate wisdom. So with meditation, you can also momentarily, for example, appease uh, these afflictive states of mind, all this uh, degree of stress like anger, desire, jealousy, all this can come to uh, momentarily not be uh, kind of uh, functioning or be appeased for a moment, not be active, so to speak. Uh, yet, uh, really, if you don't overcome the con confusion, the really root of it, the framework, you don't overcome confusion or ignorance, the framework of it is still present. So only the antidote to ignorance or confusion is wisdom. So meditation alone is not sufficient. You need to, on top of meditation, cultivate wisdom. That means here we distinguish two types of meditation, calm abiding meditation. Calm abiding meditation alone is not sufficient. You need also to cultivate the meditation of discernment, of wisdom, known as Vipassana, uh, and that will enable us to overcome uh, the confusion or the ignorance. So here, what I would like you to, and to do is <clears throat> to introspect a little bit as your homework, you know, let me say, to introspect, to look at your own mind, what, what is, what state of mind am I in, you know, in everyday life? Look if what I said is true or not. If you if you think about your everyday, if you look inwardly, your mind is constantly in a state of stress, a state of agitation. It goes from uh, desire to hatred, it's always discriminating, uh, always in this hope and fear, uh, expectation. <clears throat> There is this worry of the self that is constantly present. You don't even have to think about it. It's always there. This is kind of our everyday kind of usual state of being. You might think, oh, I don't have desire. I don't have anger. I don't have, I'm not, I'm a good person. We all think of ourselves as a good person. Uh, fundamentally, we are. We are, we have Buddha nature. We are, we are very fundamentally awakened, but yet, because we're unable to actualize that, we, we are constantly in a state of stress, in a state of suffering, a state of difficulty that is created by our own mind, by our own mind's confusion. So the thing is here, first look inwardly and see uh, really that this is the case. So then he, you can understand here how it is important to work with your mind because there are, there are qualities within your mind that you can actualize that you can really rely on and find true freedom, true genuine uh, well-being that is unconditioned by anything. Uh, and this will give you the motive to you know, practice. Uh, so this, I think, is an important point. So I'd like to invite you to uh, think, about, uh, think about that. Now, <clears throat> Uh, when it comes to the practice of meditation, we introduced it yesterday. And I'd like to go through, again, a short session with you of meditation and remind you what we already spoke about yesterday in relation to practice of meditation. That is uh, the postures, the physical, mental posture, so physical posture is the seven point posture uh, with its variants. So the back straight, the shoulders <coughs> open, the, the chin brought in slightly, uh, the jaw in a relaxed position, uh, the palms on your lap, uh, your legs crossed, your eyes semi closed, those are seven points. Uh, for those of you who are sitting on the chair, this other version, uh, feet flat on the ground, uh, palms on your thighs. Uh, <clears throat> but more importantly, the mental posture. Do not think about 
the past, not think about the future. Just let your mind in its present state. You can see your mind is clear and it's luminous, aware of everything. It's very aware, very present, uh, very clear and very present. <clears throat> Yet leave it without thoughts, without uh, kind of uh, discriminating the present. But just let your mind be. Don't try to make your mind into something else. Just let the mind relax. And to help it from wandering here and there, uh, keep your focus on your breath, the breathing in and out of your nose. You're just aware of that. And you just let your mind breathe, uh, breathe. I mean, be uh, relaxed while you are, your your focus is on the breath going in and out. Okay, so <clears throat> to a short uh, session of uh, meditation here.
Um, so, um, <clears throat> I recommend, uh, as I was telling you yesterday, that uh, to, to focus mainly on the quality of the meditation more than at the beginning on the quantity, but even if it's short sessions, you should try to repeat them often, and, and this way you can make progress. However, <clears throat> If you're really interested uh, to go more deeply into learning about meditation, it's important to uh, follow a meditation course, uh, such as we do uh, in the body paths, uh, <clears throat> to really get a more thorough instruction into the practice of meditation. Now, to come back a little bit to, uh, about the mind, mm, we distinguish, uh, you could say, between consciousness and uh, mind in its original primordial state. Mm -hmm. So mind in its primordial original state, when it's, that is completely actualized, that's what we call awakening or the state of Buddha. Okay? But mind in our present state, where it is confused in this dualistic grasping in those terms we talk about we use the term of consciousness okay uh, <clears throat> so here um, uh, so the buddha said what we are there's no self we are just a made up of a, our psychophysical constituents and among our psychophysical constituents you have of course the physical, the body, and then what it pertains to the mind or consciousness. So you have uh, the consciousness and consciousness has a number of, uh, uh, it has its kind of, uh, we spoke about earlier, you know, the samskaras, how uh, the conditioning forces uh, <clears throat> that um, is made up of all the different, actually, uh, you could say, facets of the mind. So some, sometimes here we use factors. I won't go into the detail of speaking about the five aggregates. Just look at here uh, some of the mental facets that I think are important for us to know, uh, to understand a little better how our mind functions from the with this uh, point of view. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> uh, so here, this is look, looked at in uh, the, to see how the mind is conditioning itself in each instance, uh, conditioning of each instant perpetuating perpetuating the next, so to speak. <clears throat> so consciousness is, you know, our, basically our phenomenal awareness. We're aware of, uh, through our senses. So, uh, that is, you know, experiencing in a way you that you notice. So this is a, a series of moments like that flowing through time where you you notice you are. So when we are awake, you could say we're always conscious. Every awake moment is a moment where you are a conscious, aware. Uh, this consciousness has also, from Buddhist point of view. Another form, for example, where it is inactive yet still present in, uh, in, in deep sleep. Uh, each moment, so to speak, of awareness, of consciousness. Though, so you have 
uh, you know, the, the, the should, you could say the sheer apprehension or sheer awareness of, of uh, phenomena, consciousness. And <clears throat> this is a series, this is a series of instances of consciousness. You could wonder what is one instant consciousness. Of course, uh, as we saw, you cannot really find it uh, an irreducible instant, it is com completely changing. But in terms of time, sometimes, for example, the scriptures say one sixty-fourth of the snap of a finger. So this means it's like ordinary people are not aware at that level, but you could train yourself apparently to become aware at that level, uh, uh, short, that short time. So we don't need to, so to speak, reflect or uh, introspect in any way whatsoever to know that we are conscious. It's just simply to being awake, uh, our functioning way we are, uh, we, we are conscious. That is, you could say, minimal consciousness. So, uh, <clears throat> so this consciousness has a, a number of facets, what we call mental facets. So, uh, each instant of consciousness kind of uh, conditions the next instant of consciousness. And each instant of consciousness includes both the, as I said earlier, just the simple uh, grasping of an object, the simple, simple fact of being uh, aware. And there are a number of other features that accompany each instant of uh, consciousness. Uh, and these features are called uh, sometimes mental factors. Here I'll use the term mental facets. They can be, they're both of a cognitive nature or also of affective nature. <clears throat> so for example, in the Buddhist Abhidharmas, there's a list of uh, 51 uh, mental facets or factors. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for example, desire, you know, anger, those are mental facets. They accompany that uh, simple awareness of uh, uh, the sheer apprehension of the object of, you know, phenomena. It is accompanied. It is accompanied with a number of different facets. Uh, anger can be one, for example. Desire also. So <clears throat> here, uh, these fifty-one mental fa facets are generally uh, categorized uh, into a group of what is called the omnipresent uh, mental facets. The <clears throat> Uh, de uh, the omnipresent facets, the determinative facets, the wholesome facets, the unwholesome facets, and the undetermined facets that are neither wholesome or unwholesome. This is a kind of uh, uh, categories in which they fall. So we'll just look at the first two of these categories here. Uh, so the basic uh, facets uh, known as omnipresent facets. They're called omnipresent because um, they are present at each and every moment. Every moment of, uh, uh, of awareness has these five uh, facets. That means you could say minimal consciousness even consciousness without reportability, that means even if you are not conceptualizing, you cannot report about being conscious, just the minimal uh, moment of consciousness that is characterized by having these five facets. So these five facets are, uh, and the literal, uh, literal translation is contact, uh, but I, I would translate that, I think, more by sensation. Okay, 
Uh, that's how the word sensation it corresponds more to the word sensation in English. The se second facet is uh, feeling. Uh, third facet is intention. A fourth is uh, selection or uh, perception, say. So I'm a little confused here. There's the word apperception, but in between, I think it's a, between French and English, I think it has two different meanings. It doesn't work in English, but it works in French. Uh, so um, you could say selection here also. I'll explain each of them. And then the fifth one is attention. So you have sensation, feeling, intention, selection, and attention. These five facets are always present at uh, every moment of consciousness. Consciousness is seen as um, uh, so so consciousness is very much related also with uh, <clears throat> And these five uh, uh, five facets, you always uh, have them at every uh, every moment of consciousness. So there can be other, uh, for example, instances of consciousness more elaborate, uh, uh, where there is, for, for example, phenomenal reportability. Oh, this is blue, this is red, this is nice, this is not nice. That type of more elaborate uh, uh, kind of conceptualization of your experience also has these uh, five uh, omnipresent facets, but it entails uh, at least a few of the determinative facets uh, for uh, for that uh, reportability. You say. Okay. <clears throat> so the first one, uh, contact or uh, sensation, it's. Uh, uh, it's the coming together of you know consciousness with its uh, with together working together with one of the sense faculties and its corresponding object. So when you divide consciousness, you can divide it into the uh, six faculties. So you have, for example, visual consciousness uh, as associated with uh, the visual sense coming into contact with the visual object, color, form, and so forth. And that gives you uh, a, uh, this, this, you know, the kind of, uh, through the sensory organ stimuli with an object, you, know, you have sensation. So this is kind of the, uh, immediate, empirical, uh, first-hand kind of uh, immediate experience uh, of the object. So each uh, instant of uh, consciousness is consciousness of something. You're not conscious of uh, nothing. You're always conscious of something. There's always an ob consciousness as, as something dual necessarily uh, corresponds to an object. So that's why it's uh, omnipresent. And then there is uh, Vedana in sans Sanskrit, which is, uh, which we translate by feeling. So this, the contact, the sensation, then falls into the realm of, you could say, uh, how you experience it, what it's like, you know? Whether it's, is it nice, not nice, neutral? So uh, basically, uh, feeling is of, of three types. It's either uh, pleasant, unpleasant, or you could say painful, or neutral. Yeah, so each instant of consciousness also uh, is not just the sensation. It, it falls into the realm of 
uh, experience how it's like and you have uh, this impression of it being uh, either neutral, neither painful nor pleasant, or it is a painful experience or a pleasant experience. So then uh, you have intention. Mm. So this is related to uh, volition, uh, apprehension. So it is the fact of your mind being, so to speak, uh, turned towards object for a purpose. Uh, get, you, get what you want. Avoid what you don't want. Uh, this intention is, you know, approach avoidance. A mind is turned outwardly. Um, the uh, the, uh, the activity, so to speak, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of intention is it's basically mental act. It's the, the, action, of the uh, action of the mind. It's karma, you know, karma, action of the mind, in the sense that uh, you, have, you can distinguish between uh, intending act and intended act sometimes in this Abhidharma literature. The intending act is your intention. What you want, what you don't want, in your, uh, it's the intending act. Um, the intended act is the physical, verbal action through the intention that you express. Because you want, you reach out and try to grasp. Uh, that's, for example, uh, the intended act. The intending act is you want that, and so because you want that, then you reach out and you grasp it, and or you say something, bring me that, or whatever. So you have. Uh, um, so here, of course, it's uh, related to our our intentions are related here to basically because we have this confusion. You know, you have this approach avoidance. You you are discriminating. Uh, things from positive, negative. Uh, there's this hope and fear, you have attraction, aversion. So when there is uh, attraction, you have desire and uh, you have an intention towards that. So basically, uh, this is uh, intention, but here at its very basic uh, level, at the omnipresent level, it is. Uh, uh, this basic approach, avoidance. So each instant of uh, consciousness uh, carries that also. <clears throat> so it is what conditions the mind to engage with, you could say, wholesome or unwholesome deeds, the intention. Then uh, the fourth one is called Samjnya in Sanskrit, Dushye, uh, Tibetan. And uh, this is selection. You could call it selection. Um, it's related to perception and recognition. It's the fact that you, you differentiate and identify a particular object, the fact that you different, differentiate. It's the fact that your mind uh, picks one object out of the background. It's, a, it's the aspect of the mind that will, you know, uh, select or recognize a certain feature of an object. So to give you an example, uh, to help you uh, with uh, selection or a perception, perception here is, uh, perception doesn't really work actually in English. Anyway, imagine you're walking down the street in, in a, a very noisy place. You, there's all kinds of sounds and somebody cries out your name. Okay? Says, uh, I don't know, John. <laughs> and uh, he says it one time, two times, 
And then finally, out of all that noise, you recognize that one sound. Oh, I mean, so that is selection. It's an uh, omnipresent facet of consciousness where consciousness about being con it, it, being conscious entails this duality of subject or object and being conscious of something. And uh, it entails that it is something that you experience as neutral, pleasant, or painful. And there, there is an approach avoidance in it. There's an intention in it. Of course, here, uh, related with uh, uh, the I, and it entails also selecting features. Being conscious is being conscious of something in one particular fe feature. For example, if you think of red you, or of something, you select it out of all the stimuli of, uh, of your sense. For example, your ear is hearing all the sounds, but the, it is your mind that is selecting out of all of those sounds your name and recognizing it. That capacity is what here we called, uh, we translated by uh, selection. So it, actually it's basically what consciousness does. Consciousness selects. Okay. So this is one of the um, five aggregates. You know, uh, two of the facets uh, are so important in our everyday life that the Buddha uh, spoke of, to underline them, spoke of them separately. That is feeling and representation or selection. So sometimes this is translated by representation or notion also, because the fact of sele selecting is how you, how you see something, uh, how you consider something, what is your opinion about something. The reason why the Buddha the underlined these two aspects is because they play such an important role in our life. Uh, most human beings, all their preoccupation is around their feeling, avoiding pain, getting pleasure, uh, ordinarily. And all those who are, let's say, more inclined into philosophical reflection, it's about how they uh, think of things, how they conceive of reality, how they basically select it and what they consider to be important, the disagreements between people, as oh, this is important, no, that is important, because they play such an important role in our life. They were brought out, but they are just actually uh, part of the omnipresent facets of our consciousness. And then uh, you have attention. Uh, mm. uh, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> then you have attention. So attention manaskara is the Sanskrit name. Uh, it's the the fact. Uh, you know, you could say, maybe in modern language, select and hold. You know, with the computer, <laughs> you select something and you hold it. Manaskara is a little bit like that. <laughs> it's that you select and that it is the mind <coughs> focusing on its object. It has the function of holding the mind onto the perceptual object. So sometimes in texts they describe the, diff uh, diff the difference between intention and attention. Intention is like your, your mind uh, turning towards an object uh, through the approach avoidance of something. And uh, then it uh, kind of se you know, selects it, distinguishes characteristics, and then it holds on to it. So it's more... Uh, uh, into the detail of it. So 
So, uh, so these are the five omnipresent uh, facets. Then there's another group of facets, mental facets, called the determinative facets. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, so the, these are uh, facets that help the mind, so to speak, uh, determine, ascertain or determine its object. So, for example, some of them are necessary, as I was saying earlier, for us to be able to say, oh, I'm conscious of uh, this color, this is blue, I'm hungry, uh, for that type of uh, reportability, you could say what you're experiencing, at least some of these are necessary. That's why it is called the determinative facets. So the first one on the list is uh, janda in Sanskrit, which is interest. Mm. <coughs> mm. It's the fact of being, to have interest in something, meaning here, the kind of definition is it is the desire to be endowed with this or that attribute of a thing that one wishes to obtain. So to have this or this thing, there's something you, uh, uh, you have an interest in something, you like something and you want, you want it. So um, it, it, it is a basis, it provides, it is the basis for making a diligent effort. You know, it's the basis of uh, perseverance. Because you have interest, you can develop perseverance. Uh, so it is basically, you know, example is I want, I don't want. I want this, I don't want this. I'm not interested. Uh, lack of interest. Absence of interest. So and then you have uh, the following one, which is Adi Moksha. So this is a little bit different, difficult to translate. Uh, some, of, some have translated as orientation. Mm. Mm. So it's basically kind of the, uh, it's the, the, it's what holds the mind onto a determining thing as it has determined it. So it prevents the mind from uh, kind of withdrawing from that. It keeps the mind uh, oriented on that. So for example, uh, it's, I think it's, it's, more, it's more telling when you use the example. It's like when you say, oh, that's important. No, that's, delicious. Uh, so your, your basically your attention is being oriented into, an, into something uh, and, it, 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 and it states hold on to it. It, uh, it, it is also really, I think maybe a word that can work is like appreciation. Uh, also in a negative sense, you know, Whatever you you have basically determined something to be in a certain way, and as you have determined it to be, you uh, stay on that. You consider it on that. So sometimes it's been uh, translated for that reason as conviction or decisiveness. So basically, it's the fact you think something is appropriate, something is trustworthy, and uh, uh, something is like that. And because you think it's like that, you uh, you st stay focused on that. So to speak, adik moksha. And then another one, which is very important one, is smriti temba. Uh, so literally, this is retention, uh, and often, you know, uh, today we speak about mindfulness training a lot. See? 
and this is what is translated. Uh, this is what is being translated by the word mindfulness, is smriti. So it's um, uh, basically it's defined as the mind not losing track of an entity uh, to which it is acquainted. So retention also, for example, smriti is uh, memory also. This sense. Mm. So it, it, its function is non-distraction. So it's actually, uh, you could say, uh, anti-selection. <laughs> in a certain way, meaning that uh, your con what your consciousness always does, it selects one thing, then jumps to another thing, steps, uh, selects another thing, selects another thing. And uh, uh, mindfulness, retention, uh, is what keeps your mind from selecting again. It is selected and stays focused on that. It retains what it is acquainted with. So for example, this is important in meditation, we talk about mindfulness. For example, you'll be mindful of your conduct. You'll be mindful, uh, for example, an ethical practice. You know what is it you have to do, what you shouldn't do, and uh, you will not wander away from that. Meditation, your mind is focused on your breathing, uh, observing the mind, letting the mind's qualities qualities arise of calmness, of clarity, well-being. And uh, in order to enable that to arise, you want your mind to not continue selecting. So you select one object, which is the breath. And then staying mindful of that is anti-selection of something else. So somehow it blocks, if you want, other selections. Uh, and then you have concentration, samadhi, uh, which is often also translated by uh, meditation. So somehow uh, this is not something that you do, it's something that happens with, uh, thanks to mindfulness. Because you cult, what you cultivate, what you're cultivating, your training is your mindfulness. As you train your mindfulness, then eventually all the uh, uh, distractions and so forth subside, and your mind is uh, uh, extremely clear, vivid, uh, focused, uh, undisturbed. This is kind of uh, the result. You can't immediately say, oh, I'm going to get there right away, something that you have to uh, cult cultivate. And the means to that is uh, um, mindfulness. So for example, in meditative uh, uh, teachings on meditation, uh, there's also another, there's a couple that is presented, uh, mindfulness and um, awareness. Uh, so mindfulness is this uh, anti-selection, if you want, and uh, awareness is that immediately when, because you are mindful, then immediately when you see a distraction arise, you become aware of it. So let's bring it back to the uh, to meditation. Okay, well, so you're meditating. You've selected an object. To place your attention upon, for example, the cycles of your breath in this case, or for example, the visualized image of a Buddha, or just a visual object, whatever it is that you place your attention on, uh, you are mindful of that. As you're mindful of that, it may occur that at one point a thought arises or distraction arises. <coughs> And then you are aware of that distraction that has ar arisen. And because you're aware, 
then you're able uh, to come back to the point you've been focusing on. So awareness and uh, retention or mindfulness, they work together. Mindfulness and awareness, they work together. So if you have mindfulness, you can become aware of awareness. What usually happens is that you have one thought. I mean, you're, you, you've selected something. Uh, you're thinking about something and then another thought arises and then you select that. Uh, and then you're not even aware that you deselected the first one. You just go to another one and another one. This is how uh, the distraction generally occurs. So when you're meditating, because you're focusing on that one object, your mind is um, trying to be mindful of that. And as soon as you see that, that you, you can see if that mind, you're aware of it also. You see if your mind is, is drifting away or not, you'll be able to notice it. So noticing that is the aspect of uh, awareness. Sometimes it's translated as uh, attention. Anyway, this is uh, just a uh, parenthesis here. And then you have the last uh, determinative facet, which is discernment. So this is, of course, it can be related to uh, Understanding properly means the capacity to give a reliable report on the object. You can do something with it. You can act effectively in the world. Uh, you're, you're able to uh, have a act an accurate knowledge of uh, reality. It's discernment. Of course, the highest degree of that is highest form of uh, discernment is the wisdom. So here uh, I presented you these uh, basic mental facets. Um, so uh, kind of to, uh, to continue with a little bit the parenthesis I, I made to speak about um, you know, awareness, uh, attention. There's also something else that uh, uh, another word that is used also in the uh, this practice, which is um, carefulness, you could say carefulness or conscientiousness, meaning that uh, if you are a little bit careless, like for example, if you're going to drive somewhere, if you're careless, you might be prone to an accident. So to be careful means that you know that you could have an accident and all the consequences of if they, you did go into an accident that your, your life would be in danger. So often we are mindless and careless. We walk this, across the street without looking uh, left and right. We don't think that danger can happen to us, that it happens to others. Uh, we often have that type of attitude um, and uh, in general life with things like driving and crossing the street. But we have that, all of us, uh, in regards to our spiritual practice, you could say, or uh, of our becoming in a certain sense. And we think, oh, re being reborn as an animal, being reborn in hell, these things that happen to others, not to me. Uh, we might consider that as something very foreign to ourselves or we're not careful about that. And we're not careful about uh, recognizing actually what is wholesome and unwholesome in our mind. Uh, we, we are not able to distinguish between the wholesome and the unwholesome facets of our mind. You know? uh, desire arises and we don't see it as something unwholesome. We just go with it. Uh, anger arises. We don't see it as something unwholesome. We just go with it. Uh, and somehow that, that is done because of a certain degree of carelessness. Carelessness, meaning here, lack of uh, actually recognizing the problem and the danger. You see, in that sense, carelessness. 
you, 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 you don't see the danger, you don't see the problem of these, you're not able to see. So the very first thing is to, 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 to understand the negative aspects of these uh, uh, afflictive states of mind, how they are, how anger is the worst thing you can do for yourself and for others, no matter what decision, there's nothing ever that justifies anger. Uh, how desire is just going into more pain and suffering. If you're able to uh, recognize that, then you start to uh, become more, more aware. You see the danger you can be in. Uh, you know, it's the Master Shanti Deva and the Bodhicharya Vatara. He gives this beautiful image. He speaks of. Uh, uh, the my the the our mind like a, a wound that you have to or, or, or ordinary state of mind like a wound you have to protect you know they imagine you're a person you have a injury and you have to go through a crowd you'll be very careful so nobody touches your wound to avoid the pain in the same way you have to be very careful somehow with your mind understanding that your mind is the source of all the pain. It can create so much pain and suffering for you. So if you, you, uh, if you have that awareness, if you can distinguish between what is wholesome, unwholesome within your mind, then you, you have, so to speak, the basis for uh, practicing really. Uh, uh, unless you, know, you, will, you will not be effectively practicing in, uh, in your life. It will be a theory or just something that you're interested in. So you have to be able to, you know, really see how that your real enemies are not out there. Nobody externally can harm you more than your mind's confusion and unwholesome uh, tendencies it has, such as anger, desire, jealousy, pride, all of these, uh, when they arise in your mind, you experience dissatisfaction. Everything you do through it creates more dissatisfaction and pain and suffering for you in the future. So they are, in this sense, completely unwholesome. So to understand that, and so in this sense, have a carefulness. The carefulness is very important in this way. So for example, also in the practice of meditation, uh, which is extension of, so to speak, this practice, you can uh, be confronted with all types of things you might find very important, more important than practicing meditation. You know, meditation can be something extremely boring, sitting on a cushion, there's nothing uh, uh, interesting to it, nothing exciting to it, nothing distracting to it. There, there's no desire in it, no uh, hatred in it, none, none of that. So it's something very subtle, very difficult for a lot of us to appreciate. So to uh, so carefulness here is you know you understand that actually all this agitation of the mind is going nowhere. It's really actually going nowhere. At the end of the day, all of this stress, all of this worry, all of this is not going to bring you anything. It's just creating the problem. It is the problem. If you're able to uh, see this, then you uh, you develop a sense of you know be able being able to distinguish between what is wholesome, unwholesome, and to try to cultivate what is wholesome for yourself. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, uh, yes, so that's carefulness. Carefulness, parieu is the Tibetan word, to be careful. And on that basis, then you have to rely on uh, <coughs> awareness and mind mindfulness and awareness. If you're careful, then you would want to be mindful. If you're not careful, so to speak, what are you going to be mindful of? You, know, you want to be mindful of not doing what is harmful for you, trying to cultivate the wholesome things. 
So if you don't have a sense of what is it you have to be careful about, uh, and not, if there's no conscientiousness, so to speak, there, then there is uh, uh, no really need to be mindful. So because you have that uh, care, you, you have that distinction, then you will try to be careful and on the basis of that carefulness, you will be able to become aware, therefore, when your mind is going towards what is unwholesome or not, being agitated or not. So here, these are kind of important tools if you really want to, uh, you know, being a Buddhist practitioner, it's not about belonging to a tradition uh, that will not liberate you. You have to practice. And practice means what you want to do is transform your mind, go from confusion to wisdom. And so for that, you have to be able to distinguish what is actually wisdom. And many people might think, oh, wisdom is this, wisdom is that, have all kinds of concepts, but actually wisdom is very much related to the innate qualities of the mind, the suchness of the mind, tathata, the uh, reality of the mind as it is. So it is uh, this, you know, uh, luminosity inseparable with emptiness. So being able to recognize that and cultivate that without following into uh, dualistic co consciousness. But to do that, you can't do that directly. You have to start by working with your consciousness, understanding how your consciousness functions and understanding all the tools that you can use, like carefulness, this distinction. We, we know how to um, discriminate. So we use our capacity to discriminate in order to uh, see what is really wholesome and unwholesome, and then uh, be careful in our life. And if we are careful in our life, that will make us be mindful of what is it we should do and not do. As we are mindful, we will be aware, we will be able to follow through and see if we are uh, being wholesome or not. And then in this way, uh, progressively, we will transform. At the beginning, maybe afflictive states of mind will be predominant in our mind, you know, like anger, desire, jealousy, all these old habits that we have will always keep on arising and uh, because they have been there. But eventually with this training, slowly, slowly, they will subside. There was one Katampa master, uh, apparently he, each time he had a negative thought, he would put a black stone. Each time he had a wholesome thought, he would put a white stone one place and then uh, working with his mind in this way. And then at the beginning, he had a huge pile of black stones and just one or two little white stones. And, then, and eventually he had only white stones. So it's a process of training. Yeah, so here, for example, in the Bodhisattva uh, uh, path that we emphasize, we have to cultivate altruism, you know? uh, cultivating uh, lo through love, kindness, loving kindness and compassion, uh, trying to overcome our selfishness. The selfishness is the expression of our dualism of our confusion, we saw that. And so through cultivating altruism, we, uh, we transcend that also. So it is, uh, uh, you know, also you should train in the Bodhisattva path in this way. Do you, when, I, when do you have selfish thoughts or not? Selfish thoughts are all unwholesome. As I said earlier, all the suffering in this world comes from wanting your, your own good and your own happiness. All the happiness in this world comes from wanting the happiness of others, being <clears throat> altruistic. So there, altruism, even if it costs you, it will always have a good result. Uh, selfishness, even if you think immediately you seem to profit, it will always have a negative result. Just within the, how the mind works. If you understand this confusion, you can see how that is really true. It's not being good and bad is not because somebody decided, oh, arbitrarily doing this is good, doing that is bad because he knows better. You can really see within your mind what is wholesome, what is unwholesome. 
it is a really a, just a reality. Unwholesome is what perpetuates confusion, what perpetuates stress and suffering. What is wholesome is what liberates you from that and what enables your mind to actualize its innate qualities. So I spoke a lot. Maybe you have questions. I'm sorry. Yes. They ask the um, is the notion is carefulness another way of another aspect <coughs> of discernment, or is it viewed as a sort of another separate point that you know you, it flows from discernment? Um, I think it's uh, it's a different aspect. I mean, discernment is being able to uh, well, it is a certain type of discernment. Yes. Uh, however discernment has a greater scope. Like it is about understanding reality as such. Whereas carefulness is just about, uh, it's on the basis of your understanding and your relative discernment between what is wholesome, unwholesome. Uh, well, let's, let's say, based on your discernment, it is the effort that you will make So is it all, it's characterized with the, act, the activity component? Yes. As a, as a beginner practitioner, if you don't have that, uh, once you're very well trained, it might, it might, it comes naturally. But at the beginning, you have to learn uh, to distinguish and then uh, that will lead you to be careful. So it's not, it's slightly different from uh, uh, discernment. It is really the, it's somewhat a little bit fear-based, you know. You're fearful of what is uh, unwholesome. You can see the shortcomings of your mind. So the more I'm understanding when you're talking about wisdom, um, it sounds like, it sounds like in the Buddhist tradition, that's entirely an internal understanding of the, the mind's processes. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then it sounds like then essentially the, the wholesome or unwholesome thoughts or actions or speech are, you know, in a sense, indicators of, of whether you've achieved a, a, a degree of wisdom or not. Like you were saying with those rocks, mm -hmm. that analogy that those are, in some sense, the byproducts of, of, of that wisdom. Almost like not those well, are not necessarily the thing. Well, know. yeah, I think you have to distinguish between different degrees of discernment. When we talk about wisdom, it, it's really something that is. Oh, I'm sorry. So the. Uh, I don't know how to formulate. The question was kind of long. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll just go through the answer. Um, I think it's important to distinguish between different types of discernment, different levels of understanding. You can have an accurate, proper understanding of uh, reality, which we would call wisdom, so to speak. Uh, for example, you understand that things are actually impermanent, unlike you tend to look at them as permanent. You actually understand that what you have been taking for a source of pleasure is actually a source of dissatisfaction. That is a certain degree of discernment, of understanding. Uh, it is, you can call it a certain degree of wisdom. But then you have much higher wisdom, which is actually uh, the true state of your mind, the true nature, the primordial nature of your mind, free of all dualistic clinging. This is what you need to kind of actualize if you want to overcome confusion. So other forms of uh, discernment are like within your confusion, you can 
you, it's a dualistic way of, of looking at things. Like for example, uh, to look at things that are impermanent and conceive them as permanent is very misleading. You're misleading yourself very strongly. It's great confusion. And it is more accurate to see impermanent as impermanent, but still it is a dualistic view uh, that falls into the frame of a subject and an object of a conception about how reality is. Ultimate kind of wisdom doesn't uh, fall into that kind of category. It transcends the duality. It is a knowledge that is not a knowledge that is conceptual, that represents itself reality. It knows it directly, immediately. It knows the true nature of mind and therefore of all that it can be known. There's a question online. Mm -hmm. Is it more beneficial to be in retreat in order to cultivate carefulness or is it better to be in our everyday world? Uh, it, it depends uh, really on the individual. I think uh, <coughs> we are uh, where we are, whether we are in retreat or whether we are not, I think carefulness should be developed wherever we are from this moment onwards. From the moment on, we understand and we can make that distinction. You're able to make that distinction and understand what is wholesome, what is unwholesome. Uh, then you will, from that moment onwards, start to be careful. And because you are careful, that might lead you to want to do retreat, uh, you know. Uh, and retreat can be, uh, it, it's not about, I think it's something you can develop in any circumstances. There's not a, a framework where it's, easier or worse. There are difficulties in retreat as there are in everyday life. Maybe sometimes it might be easier in retreat, less uh, people harming you or difficulties. So it's important to, as a practitioner to confront both. That means, first of all, as a practitioner, you will learn about affective states of mind. You'll learn how to work with them. You will try to subdue them and try to you know learn how even in the face of violence and harm you won't fall into anger and then in retreat there's nobody harming you so you feel like oh i've subdued my anger and then you should go out and see if really it works or not <laughs> you made progress or not so it's not just a one situation one place thing it's something you know you know practice is something you have to do or, all circumstances, and you can do in all circumstances. Um, there's another question. Mm -hmm. Feel free to raise your hands, but in the meantime, I'll read questions that come in online. Um, how should we work with the mental facets presented? How should you work with them? <coughs> mm, well, uh, I think. What you could do as uh, is uh, review what we talked what what we talked about. Uh, think about these facets and try to see if it's actually like that or not. Trying to understand your own mind. You know, we talked about uh, sensation, feeling, intention, um, uh, selection, uh, attention. You know, five omnipresent and so this gives you an understanding of you know the minimal consciousness how it is and you should in, uh, introspect and see really if it if it is like that or not try to make sense of it uh, and then if you, uh, you understand uh, you understand that you understand basically how our ordinary consciousness functions And, and then with the determinative facets, you know how to, uh, you can see how meditation is working, how meditation uses these elements, how meditation uses mindfulness, 
and uh, interest and orientation. These are very important. Interest, orientation, uh, mindfulness, uh, concentration, and discernment or wisdom are very important aspects of, of practice. Now you understand what these terms actually mean and how these are actually used in meditation. person who asked that said thank you. Um, another question is, uh, please, at the beginning of the lecture, you talked about solipsism mm -hmm. and how it relates to emptiness as self. So could you please comment a bit more about that? Uh, no, the term solipsism, what is the question about that term? Uh, please comment on how solipsism relates to emptiness as the self. As relates to emptiness as the self. I don't understand the question. Uh, maybe just, can you talk about solipsism? Okay. <laughs> solipsism is like, uh, there was a English philosopher called Berkeley. You know, he thought that everything is just your mind, and somehow there's only your mind and God. And uh, that can, uh, you know, to think that everything, the, the house, the mountain, other people, it's just you. you know, for example, that's a solipsis view. I mean, you're alone. Everything is just your mind. All other people, everything you see is just your mind. It's you. That's the solipsis view. And so this is not the view, or this is not our view in uh, Buddhist teachings or in the Mahayana teachings, and particularly uh, the mind-only school of the uh, Chitramatra, they uh, are not saying that everything is just your mind. There's this quotation of the Buddha, that the Buddha says, uh, the, the, the world, the three realms of the universe are but mind. When he says that, what he means, it's not a solipsis view, he's saying, the three little worlds are nothing but our perception. You see, so uh, other sentient being, if the, you know, if, if if we had a solipsis view, then if somebody attained awakening, everybody else would attain awakening at the same time. Each and every individual has their own distinct uh, mind stream. Uh, the world, the planet, has its own causes and conditions. Uh, it has its own history, whether we are here or not. However, what we know of the world, what we know of others, what we perceive is something that is uh, revealed to ourselves through our mind. And in that sense, is not separate from our mind. And our, percep uh, our, our perception of it, our participation in this world and how we see it is all something that our mind is creating. So the illusion is that uh, uh, not that the, that there is a mind, but the fact that we take what our mind reveals to us as something uh, substantial, something permanent, something existing. We don't see it as see it as something our mind is uh, creating. We take our mind to be, so to speak, like a just a passive receptor that records actually a reality as it is. And we think that what we are perceiving is actually out there exactly like that. Actually, it's something that is made up by our psychophysical constituents. If we had different type of eyes, different type of brain, we would see different colors, different shapes, different things. Uh, also, you can see you know, how we select. How we select is how, how we look at things, what features we uh, chorus take to be important. Uh, out of all, all of these uh, stimuli that we have, so, our, our, our experience of reality is something that our mind constructs. It is not given to us as it is. It is something that our mind builds. But our illusion is to think that it is given to us like that, and it's like that. It's not constructed by our mind.
Um, I have trouble understanding what mind would be absent experience of some kind of phenomenon. You know, you were to an extent making a distinction between mind and consciousness. I mean, when we talk about the three realms, we're saying that there's a formless realm, <coughs> although that is still part of samsara. I mean, what would that be? What would it precisely? Other, other than just unconsciousness. Uh, you mean consciousness without, what was it you said exactly? Well, without any kind of uh, phenomena, any perception. Yeah, any perception, consciousness without perception. Well, uh, the, the consciousness by definition is consciousness of something. So there is not mm -hmm. a consciousness without uh, perception of something. However, that doesn't mean that uh, how con consciousness functions and how consciousness proceeds is actually accurate. Right. So here, what we are what we are looking at as practitioners is trying to find what is the state of mind that is not misleading and reliable. Consciousness misleads us. Consciousness is a way of uh, distinguishing in duality phenomena and looking at things in a certain way which misleads us and which is the framework for all of our dissatisfying experience. So we are, this is our general mode of actually, but the innate qualities of our mind are not separate from us. Like we said earlier, you know, mind is luminous and emptiness inseparable mm -hmm. and that aspect is present within consciousness but we are unaware of it because consciousness is uh, takes the doesn't see the emptiness and takes it as the self it doesn't see luminosity uh, for quality of the mind but takes it for the other something distinct you see so that's uh, basically that dualism uh, and uh, the functioning of consciousness. Now, uh, if you can recognize uh, the mind as being luminous and uh, empty, not conceptually, not saying, oh, my mind is empty and luminous, but actually, uh, you know, through meditative practice, uh, you ha you have no concepts, no thoughts, no emotions, then just the mind, uh, free, completely free of all uh, uh, representations, conceptions, agitations, whatsoever. That state of mind is not in the state of dualistic clinging. Yet it is not clinging a blank thing. You're thinking consciousness of something there, that there has no object is being conscious of something blank, for example, or, or of nothing. It is not. It or is not that. It's a deep sleep. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and that uh, deep sleep uh, consciousness is still present there. Uh, if you are a practitioner, you can become also aware of that state. But anyway without going there, just right now in our present state, you can recognize the state of mind, which is just the natural quality of the mind, free from all uh, agitation, all uh, <coughs> our concepts that you can experience directly. Sometimes you know, the, na the natural state of mind is something that is not that uh, far away from us. Uh, we experience it actually all the time, but we are unaware of it. We are unable to recognize. We are so close. It is also so simple. It is unbelievable. So close that it is unseeable. See? Uh, uh, we, we say, for example, the moment you fall asleep, the natural state of mind appears. At the moment of death, 
at many moments during the day. For example, you have one thought that arises and that thought vanishes. And before the second thought arises, just the mind there in between those two thoughts. That's the natural state of mind, emptiness, which is always present, but we are not able to recognize it or cultivate it. We're always in this discrimination and uh, agitation. And that state is not like uh, uh, absence or it, it, it is uh, what actually enables even the discrimination to be able to be possible all this discrimination, all this uh, conception, all the affective emotions and so forth are just quality, actually qualities of the mind. Because, but the mind, those qualities of the mind don't disappear, but they are, so to speak, perverted because of ego. And if this ego and confusion is transcended, those qualities don't cease. They become uh, different aspects of uh, primordial innate qualities of the mind. Okay, thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes go ahead. Um, so I've been thinking about uh, the idea of, of mind streams that you mm -hmm. were referring to, and uh, you, know, you, you talk about them as being con continuous, um, mm -hmm. and and also, um, but also that you know there are there are many of them that we each. Have one. Mm -hmm. And uh, just trying to understand you know, how um, how they form, how they change. It's, it seems as if you know that there's this idea that they might it might be one and founded in some way. Um, but you know, are they are they continuous? Do they become well, the, the, to... Their oneness is not their original, so to speak, nature. Is because of our confusion, because of our dualistic confusion and distinction, there is this idea of oneness. There are neither one nor many, neither, uh, neither uh, same nor distinct. None of those qualities actually uh, are their inherent qualities. They're not substantially one or distinct or man many or the same. The true nature of the mind is, you, you can look at it, examine it, is uh, ineffable, undescribable, un, uh, unconceivable. But it's not, for that doesn't mean it is inaccessible, it's there. It is uh, any quality of your mind. It's just your mind. Uh, and all the distinctions of time and place and when and how, all of these are participate in our confusion, confused dualistic way of looking at it. But as long as there is this ego clinging and this confusion, well, it, it functions as a continuum uh, from one, leading from one life to another life, it has a certain function, but actually when the innate qualities have been actualized, that functioning is transcended, we are free, free from that. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll conclude here. Please uh, join me dedicating merit. Through this merit, may I attain true ambitions, then having overcome our harmful destructive forces, May I liberate sentient beings from the ocean of existence and turbulent waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. May the most precious mind of awakening that has not yet found now arise, once arisen, may it never decline, may it continue to increase evermore. May the most precious mind of awakening that has not yet found now arise, once arisen, may it never decline, may it continue to increase evermore. May the most precious mind of awakening that is not yet found now arise. Once arisen, may never decline, may continue to increase evermore.